I am so excited today to be joined by Hacky Reitman, MD, who is the founder of the nonprofit Different Brains Inc. and DifferentBrains.org. He's also an author, filmmaker, retired orthopedic surgeon, former professional heavyweight boxer, the past chairman and president and current board member of the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County, and a neurodiversity advocate and an autism dad. Welcome, Hacky, to the new mid. Well, thank you, Michelle. It's an honor to be here with the most wonderful people in the world, women. <laughs> well, I love that. Um, I just wanted to, we're going to talk a lot about autism and other neuro, neurodiversity um, issues. But before we do that, you were a professional heavyweight boxer. You were a filmmaker, author. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? No, not really. I, I grew up in Jersey City. My folks had a gas station. My dad was the mechanic. My mother used to pump gas and do the business side of things. And uh, my mother had a profound effect on me. You know, uh, uh, she, um, people used to hang out in those days in the 50s at my folks' gas station, like all their friends. And, and one time I remember my father came out, my mother was pumping gas and he it was like 3.30 in the afternoon. I was the youngest of four kids. And he says, hey, Ev, when you finish that, come in and finish the books and then get home and get dinner on the table, you know? And uh, people who knew my mother were standing around going, uh-oh, he's in trouble. <laughs> he turns around to go back in and my mother says, hey, Phil. And he turns around and she goes, and if you shove a broom up my you know what, I'll be able to sweep the floor at the same time. Up on go. Got a standing ovation. Um, I don't remember one time, I'll never forget. I was uh, I was I was a little kid and I was the youngest of four. One of my brothers was four years older than me. And he got an 88 on a spelling test. And he came up to my mother, at the gas station, she said, Oh ma, I got an 88 on a spelling test. She said, Oh, good, huh? gonna make you cookies you know and a couple of days later i come hey mom i got 92 on a spelling test she starts hitting me with the dog leash i go what the hell is this he gets an 88 he gets cookies i get a 92 i'm getting hit with the dog leash she said that's the best he can do you can get 100 on every test and you have a moral obligation to work up to your full potential with whatever gifts god gave you to help yourself your family and those less fortunate and she only had a high school diploma, but she was very well read, and I'll never forget. And it all made sense, too. And that's what we do with our interns here at Different Brains. We encourage them to use the gifts that they have. They're all over 18. They're all neurodivergent. They're all smarter than me. They're all doing great things. And, uh, you know, I say to them, you know, your brains are a lot smarter than mine. But that's nothing to be proud of. That's just a God-given thing. That's like a baseball player can hit a ball 400 feet, you know? Right. But what are you going to do with it? What are you right. going to do? And that's the key. And that's the question. And so you got to use what you have. So I was, I had a rocky start. I got expelled in the first grade and then the 10th grade. But uh, I ended up somehow or other getting into the six-year medical program at Boston University because when I was 12 years old, I used to fill up gas up and check the oil on Dr. Aronoff's car. He was our family doctor. And he was that kind of doctor like in Field of Dreams. I wanted to be like him. If I could make people feel good like him. So I started writing away to medical schools when I was 12 years old. And I said, look, uh, I wrote away to the AMA. And I said, look, I want to be a doctor but I don't want to have to go to high school and everything. Can't we hurry this up? What do you got? You know, so in those days, there was no computers. They sent back this catalog with all the medical schools and four of them had red checks. They had accelerated programs and there were, you know, Boston University, Rensselaer and Albany Medical School and uh, two other places. And I sent away for catalogs to all of them. And I chose Boston University because they were the only one that stressed liberal arts. And I had no idea what liberal arts was, but it sounded like you could meet girls with liberal arts. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, Hacky, you are just, I'm just enjoying this conversation so much. Well, you're an orthopedic surgeon. And I have to ask, 
orthopedic surgeon and boxer doesn't quite connect because <laughs> you need to protect your hands. So how did that happen? Well, what happened was when I was in my my first year of medical school, see my sport, I wasn't real good at it. My favorite sport was basketball, but all I could do was make 10th man on the Boston University freshman basketball team. But my best friends from Jersey City, I'm still best friends with, were like all American football players and on TV all the time. And I was jealous. So they said, you know how to box, why don't you enter the Golden Gloves? So I did, first year of medical school. In those days, up in Lowell, Massachusetts, you didn't use headgear. And um, that first fight, they matched me with the favorite for the whole tournament because I was heavyweight and I was little and they figured they'd give him a little Jewish guy from medical school and you know have him knock him out. And when I knocked this guy out, I became the darling of the media. And I went on to knock everybody out. Uh, I got offered a hundred thousand dollar pro signing bonus to quit medical school and go pro because I had the God given thing of I wasn't a real good boxer, but I could hit as hard as anybody in the world with my right hand. It was again nothing to be proud of. You can't train for it, but if I hit you, I'll knock you out. You Gosh, know? you're like Cinderella man. Well, <laughs> no, he's, <laughs> he's a lot better than me. But um, anyhow, I I turned down the you know 1971 hundred thousand dollars was like ten million dollars. Right. Folks had the gas station, but I was hustling six jobs to get through medical school, but I really wanted to be a doctor. So I had a 17 year layoff. And when my something happened with my daughter and she was having this emergency surgery, as a parent, you make every kind of deal in the world you can with God, you know, just let, just let Rebecca do good and I'll find the biggest, toughest guys and fight them and I'll give the purses to children's charity. So she did good. I went back into boxing. By then I was like 38 years old. I was an orthopedic surgeon and uh, I was real old. So I boxed from age 38 to 52. And I got a ton of publicity because I was bringing attention to all these children's charities. I was knocking out people. I became a 10 round main event fighter despite my advanced age. And when I was doing all the national media, Good Morning America, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, it's so funny because it was a different time, the late 80s, early 90s, because they all asked what you asked. They asked, but I remember on Roy Firestone on Good Morning America, but you're a surgeon, aren't you worried about your hands? And I used to say, how come nobody asked me about my head? Well, that was my next question, by the way. I have to tell you, that is actually my next question, especially because we're going to be talking a lot about the brain. Well, and it's, so it's, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what is he doing? You know, especially, you know, being an older boxer and taking care of your own brain. Well, I, you know, when I, I used to go on national TV and say, look, I don't recommend getting hit in the head for anybody. I don't recommend football where I was a sports medicine doc. There's a ton of concussions. They're not good for you. Uh, boxing is, uh, you shouldn't get hit in the head. It's not good for you. This was a different time way back in 71 when I was in the Golden Gloves. I, as I said, they didn't even use headgear in those days. And now you fast forward 50 years and the brain is very much on our mind. We know a lot more. There were these tremendous studies done at Boston University. I had nothing to do with them, but they did for all these football players who donated their brains to science. And um, they kind of wrote the book on CTE, you know, and all right. the concussions and trauma leading to all these problems. And um, it is a, uh, and the real pandemic that's upon us now, not because they're all caused by concussions, although a certain percentage are, is Alzheimer's and dementia. Yes, absolutely. 78%. And nobody's given anybody any hope. You know, let's have some yeah. hope. Well, you know what? Okay, let's take a step back for Hacky. So I love your stories. And we, oh my gosh, you have awesome 
stories. But can you tell me, how did you get into, you mentioned your daughter, Rebecca, briefly. How did you get into starting Different Brains? Well, what happened was um, my daughter, Rebecca, who had two major brain surgeries, 20, two, two major brain surgeries, 23 um, arterial venous malformation tumors in her brain, two of which exploded and she needed big surgeries on. And she's fine now, by the way. And she has a master's degree in psychology and is now going for, well, first she got a discrete math degree from Georgia Tech, then a master's in psychology from Lynn University and is now uh, going for a PhD in social justice. Um, but uh, um, she was really my inspiration. And when she decided against my advice to take the most difficult courses in the world at the most difficult school for this discrete mathematics, whatever that is. Um, and then when she emerged victorious, I was so taken with it. I wrote, produced and directed the movie, The Square Root of Two, starring Darby Stanfield from Scandal and, and Brett Rice is a good character actor. And, um, but after I made the movie, Rebecca was then diagnosed with autism. And I didn't know what autism was. And I figured I ought to find out what the movie was about. So I held up release of the movie and I started studying for a couple of years. And I go, what the heck is this autism? I'm going back several years now, you know, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot known about it. But when I had my aha moment, I wrote I wrote the book Asper Tools, The Practical Guide to Understanding and Embracing Asperger's Autism and Neurodiversity. And the publisher, HCI Books, who have since been swallowed up by Simon & Schuster, they didn't want me to say neurodiversity because they felt it distracted from autism and Asperger's. I said, no, but I know it's not just that. All these brains are different. And once I figured that out, I saw that all of these different entities, if you will, were in different silos and no one was communicating. So I said, let me put them all under one roof. All the different brains, mental health, developmental, neurological, because these Alzheimer's people have to start talking to the Down syndrome people, have to start talking to the anxiety and PTSD and autism people, and they're all related. We're all on one big spectrum of different traits. And that's why I started Different Brains. And the advantage I have is my ignorance because I'm not a neurologist or a neuroscientist. I'm an orthopedic surgeon when I speak around the country and I say, you know, I'm not a professional like these other people on the panel here. And they go, oh, you're just being humble. You're an MD. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, okay? You know, it's, you know what, though? You're curious is what you are, though. And that's what makes you as powerful as you are. You've always been curious and you want to learn. But not only that, you want to share your knowledge, which is what's so powerful about what you're doing. And there needs to be, as you mentioned, a brighter light on dementia, on Alzheimer, but also on autism and Asperger's and neurodiversity. You said your daughter was diagnosed later in life. Did you have any notion before then? And why did she get diagnosed later in life? Well, was it? this was back then, but even now, women are getting the short end of the stick. They're still diagnosed much later in life uh, now. But back then, we knew she was different. We had her neuropsychologically tested. They felt she had some ADHD and some memory deficits, but it wasn't uh, a popular diagnosis then. And even today, it's, I don't know what the right word is, ambiguous. That's why I'm not, I don't like myself diagnoses. I like, I like traits because in my view, you have autistic traits, you have ADHD traits, you have dyslexic traits, you have anxiety traits. You've got all of these traits and they're present in all of us in a little or a lot, okay? 
for instance, I don't know how I would have been labeled, but my brain was different. <laughs> I was getting in all kinds of trouble and having all kinds of fun. So my brain was different, but there were certain commonalities. So for instance, one of our terrific board members, uh, Dr. Marsha Ratner, a researcher at Boston University and the head of neurotoxicants.com, she has to testify in court all these time about all these things are bad for your brain, just like lead and Flint, Michigan, water and all of this stuff. But getting someone like her communicating with everybody else in the research field and being on a call with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, that's his real name, uh, just like the rock and roll, but uh, Jimi Hendrix and Marsha Ratner on a call with me talking about the commonalities of Down syndrome and uh, Alzheimer's and where the research can possibly intersect. And when I gave a talk down in Washington, D.C. at the first ever adult um, national Down syndrome conference, and it was the first ever adult one because they used to live till 20, now they live to 60. And back then in 2015, 50% of them were going on to Alzheimer's. And guess what it is now? 90%. Wow. I had no clue. I've, so I thought, I've not even heard of that before. Well, it's, it's amazing. And yeah, those yeah. are the kind of things like, yeah, the Down syndrome researchers and the Alzheimer's researchers, they got to get together and they are. Uh, you know, it's not not because of hacky, but those are the kind of things. How can you have autism and not have some anxiety and a little bit of depression? Right. Well, it's, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit more about autism because parents are still having a difficult time admitting or getting their children diagnosed. There's still a stigmatism with that. Yeah. What can you say to those parents who... Because I think there is something that is, they know something's different. They're either getting in trouble at school. And I think it really does present itself at school, whether they can, you know, whether they can stay connected and focused or they're, you know, creating a little more ruckus in the classroom. So what could you say to those parents? I, the first thing I say to them is don't feel like the Lone Ranger. That's the first thing. OK, and start to communicate with people who are in the same boat. OK, and um, let's find out. Let's go to a neuropsychologist and get your kid tested because, you know, he's different and I know he's different. But let's try to name that tune. Let's see what traits there are and let's see what accommodations we can get in school for him, which is a very big, big thing for him or for her, um, because the public schools have to give you accommodations. OK, and that's a whole nother thing. Another one of our wonderful board members here at uh, differentbrains.org is Kimberly Spire O, who's a special needs attorney. And she's fighting for these kids and parents all the time. Stigma, as you pointed out, Big problem. Well, I tell our interns, who are all different diagnoses, by the way, um, we're like a badge of courage. I got one terrific guy, um, uh, Ali, who uh, was not going to put on, who's going to be a great physician, wasn't going to put on his medical school application. He had uh, severe ADHD. This was like uh, over well over a year ago. I said, no, no, no. Come on. Come out of the closet with it. Fast forward to now, he's already had 50 webisodes of his own series with an expert in ADHD, Brooke Schnittman, called Power Tools for ADHD. One of our other interns from India joined us because he has ADHD and he saw this Power Tools for ADHD on our website. Um, he's writing a book. It's He's going to get into medical school now because of his age. You see, that's the thing. Take your gifts and your differences, harness it, and uh, go for it. And uh, listen, it's, it's a tough world out there, but you're not alone. You're with friends, 
and hang around with nice people come over to different brains well, yes and different. i i do want to talk more about different brains but before i jump into that and this might lead us into different brains but we're talking to midlife moms <laughs> you know midlife women and a lot of us might only have one child and this child might have autism the worry of their future is real and will they be able to take care of themselves what are your thoughts on that i think it's a big worry that all parents go through and uh, and autism is a spectrum and sometimes the moms and as, uh, as I say in my book on page 168, I think in my Asper Tools book, mothers like these are angels with a pit bull mentality. They got to take grief from the kid. They got to take grief from the school. The husband many times has run for the hills, okay? He's nowhere to be found. The kid's giving them aggravation. Um, hey, you're not alone. There's support out there. There's good, like anything else, there's good neuropsychologists and there's not so hot neuropsychologists too. Um, one of the big problems you run into is pediatricians and doctors get zero training in this. Zip, nada, okay? And you have to do your research and thank goodness for Google because you can find people who are familiar with what you're going through and familiar and can be helpful and everybody's different and it's always easy to say but so many of these moms are single moms you know and it's uh it's very tough so first of all you're not alone second of all get help with the best professionals you can find because you have to name that tune you have to be do what you can. And not, it's not an exact science. The other thing is, is advocate for your kid at school to make sure he or she gets the accommodations they need. Okay. Um, Patty Fazana down here as a special ed teacher has helped us a great deal with that also. And as I mentioned, Kimberly Spire. Oh, um, if you go on different brains and that top right hand thing, we have a search button, you can search almost any topic we got we got a lot of stuff on it but we're not an end all to be all uh <clears throat> and it's it's a it's a tough world out there so i'm not trying to make it like it's real easy but um like all things if you do the best you can usually it's good enough and are there careers or jobs out there for autistic uh adults absolutely and they're all organizations uh, again, you can see them in the resources page on our website. I, I, and part of the, a big part of it is matching the individual to the job. You know, people think of autism, they think, oh, they're going to be techies, they're going to be in computers. Well, yeah, Microsoft, and I'm just, I'm in touch with them. They have a big, uh, they have a big program there. I was once corrected uh, on a uh, panel by the global leader for SAP, the world's largest uh, uh, software maker, um, Jose uh, Velasquez. And uh, he said, Hacky, let me straighten you out about what you just said. And I said, please do. He said, we have this program recruiting autistic individuals, not as a social good guy program, it's good for our bottom line. When we match the individual to the right job, they'll sit at that computer for 14 hours straight. They'll do a great job. It's like anything else. You got to find, uh, you know, uh, in Jersey City, we used to say there's, there's an ass for every seat, but in other, in other <laughs> words, you got to match up the individual. And I'm always teaching our interns, use all of your assets, use them, okay? If, if like someone like yourself, the camera really likes you, use that. Video is a very powerful thing, all right? If you have a great voice, use audio. I mean, whatever it is you're good at, and everyone's, I find anyhow, that everybody's good at something, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, let's talk about different brains. How did you start the organization? And tell us a little bit about it. 
Well, I started it before I started it because with PCE Media, where I was making movies and and uh, I was uh, pitching some reality TV shows, and I've written six scripts, only one of which I made into a movie. Um, I would I would end up with interns who wanted to learn filmmaking or different things, and many of their brains were a little bit different. And I ended up starting these internships. And um, Lynn Wine said to me, in fact, why don't you start a school? You know, you're teaching all these, I say kids, but they, we go up to age 56 in our interns, you know, really. Um, and it's finding a niche. See, I was lucky. I knew what my niche was at age 12. But helping people gravitate toward what are you good at? What do you want to be good at? So all of our interns get exposed to being in front of a camera, being behind the camera, doing video editing, writing articles. We just had our latest social group uh, at one o'clock today, right before I was on with you. Uh, what did you do today? What did you do yesterday? Um, what's, you know, what's going on? Um, and we're so proud of what they end up doing again not because of us but we're we're here and they're socializing and they're sharing and they're getting trained in different skills so uh a couple of the people today um uh one of them um down in texas um preston um he he's in college at north texas state in hospitality he just got a job with marriott a lot of them are going to school and working and interning for us. We're completely flexible. I am anti one size fits all. Okay. You want to That's work? Right. Go work. You want to go to school? Go to school. You want to fit so, us in for a couple hours, five hours a week? Do it. So if a parent is listening to this, hopefully they'll go to differentbrains.org and there, there's lots of blogs there, as you were mentioning, videos, you know, you can search up different topics that you need to. Absolutely. I've interviewed 250 world neurodiversity leaders that are, and you can look at it as the video or listen to it as the audio or pull up the transcript any way your brain takes it in. We have the females only podcast, Spectrumly Speaking which I have still not been invited on with uh, <laughs> Dr. Lori Butts, the eminent forensic psychologist and attorney, and also one of our, um, one of our own uh, uh, interns who herself is an attorney and, uh, and a, uh, is a you know, self-advocate as well, um, uh, Haley Moss, who's a whole lot smarter than me and very successful and they have females only podcasts, spectrumly speaking. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the spectrum. What does that mean? To me, I don't think of it as just autism. I think it means this individual, whether he's a kid or an adult, his brain is different. His or her brain is different. Okay. And I should also add, by the way, gender issues are very common in the autism communities when I say his or her or they or and so forth. Um, and none of it occurs in isolation, okay? You can't have ADHD without some anxiety. You probably have a little bit of autism in there too. Autism definitely, to me, has ADHD traits in it. To me, those are just labels. And to me, labels are a lousy way to describe a human being. It's more of, but you need them. You definitely need them if you're going to get the help you need. And if you're going to be at the doctor and if the doctor is going to get paid, and if you're going to get the accommodations at your school, more time on the test or take the test in a quiet area or get the audio books if you're dyslexic and you can't read it or whatever it is you need. However, your brain works best. If I have a blind student and I'm a good teacher, I'm not going to be writing on the blackboard. It's, <laughs> you know, that sounds silly, but that's what we do right. with these one size fits all. So with our interns, it's like, what do you got? You know, who right, are you? Right. 
That what, is fantastic. What do you want to do? Like we have one in medical school now. We have one in law school now. We've got uh, tuberous sclerosis. We've got autism. We've got anxiety. We've got depression. We've got um, ADHD. We've got dyslexia. We have uh, one with this calculia. And they all stay involved even after they go off to whatever they're doing. They're still part of the team and they'll help each other out and that kind of thing. And it's like, like on a call today, we had all different diagnoses on the. So what? Right, <laughs> what right. Did you, no, what did you great. do the past couple of days, you know? Well, you know what's interesting is it it seems to me that a lot more adults are being diagnosed with ADHD. Oh yeah, yeah, because listen, the I'll get in trouble for saying this, but <laughs> if if your brain doesn't rewire itself nowadays to have some ADHD, you're out of touch. Because you got to jump from one topic to another. You've got to do social media. I don't care what age you are anymore. All right. You got to use email. You got to take phone calls. You got to use Zoom. You got to be virtual. You got to be live. You got to do this. You got to do that. You don't get a chance to do what I did when I was a kid. I go to the library and sit there for three hours and read a book. You can't do that. I'd go play stickball with my best friends. For a couple of hours, maybe somebody had a transistor radio to listen to the Yankee game. You know, I, you and I are going to get off this call. We're going to be backed up 50 emails. Okay. Right, right. No, it is true. Hacky, this has been so much fun. How can people get in touch with you? Well, first of all, they can go to differentbrains.org, the plural, different brains. And you can email us and contact us through them. My email is hacky003 at gmail.com, H-A-C-K-I-E-003 at gmail.com. And you, if you just Google different brains, we'll come up there all over the place. Uh, love to hear from people. I'm very email intensive. I'm not one for uh, let's chat on the phone for the half hour the first time we meet. I'd rather get an email. And for anybody who's over 18 who wants to apply to join our, our team because let me tell you all the stuff is produced by our interns our movies our documentaries our webisode series our articles and everything is by contributors and and uh, interns and um it's not one size fits all as long as you can work out it fit in five hours a week somehow we'll take you on but you have to be nice <laughs> gotta be nice so uh we'll see you at differentbrains.org. And um, I want to learn more about you, Michelle, because <laughs> there's a lot more about you. And to all of the women, all of your audience and everything, women are my heroes. And at another time, we'll get into how all of us have to advocate more for women. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much, Hacky. I love that. Before I say goodbye, though, is there any other misconceptions or is there anything in general that you would like that we haven't touched upon that you would like to mention? I would mention from one of my heroes, uh, Temple Grandin, who I felt so proud when she was holding up her book next to my book on a <laughs> stage once at the U.S. Autism. And the name of her book gives me chills. Different, not less. That's the message. Different, not less. That is fantastic. That is, I love that. That is the perfect way to end. Thank you so much, Hacky. Thank you very much. It was great to hang out with you.